Hello, my name is Carrie Walker with NACE. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Closing the Gender Pay Gap. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary Gatta, NACE's Director of Research. Take it away, Mary. Thank you, Carrie, and welcome um, this afternoon or this morning, uh, depending where you're located, um, to our um, webinar this morning on the pay gap. Um, we, I want to start just with a quick introduction of our NACE members who are joining me here on this webinar, and then we'll turn it over and start with our presentation. So I'd first like to introduce Mary Jane Daly and give her a second to uh, introduce herself to everyone. Hello, I want to thank NACE um, for organizing this and thank you all for coming. I'm Mary Jane Daly. I am a lecturer in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT, as well as the Departmental Professional Development Director, and with my highly valued colleague, Deborah Liverman, whom you're about to meet, uh, co-leader of MIT's Equal Pay Working Group. Deborah? Hello, everyone. Uh, greetings from, from Boston. Um, I saw someone in the chat said that is it's, the sun is out. The sun is out here, but it's still a bit cold. Uh, my name is Deborah Liverman. I'm the executive director of career advising uh, and professional development at MIT. We work with students, um, grad and undergrads, as, as well as postdocs, and figuring out um, what they will do um, after their time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Jane and Deborah. Um, and um, we'll, we'll start our webinar. And just a quick reminder to please put questions in the Q&A section of the of Zoom. And once we kind of go through our presentation, we'll start going through some of the questions and hope to also see a super lively um, discussion in the, in the chat. Um, and we're a day after Equal Pay Day. Um, which was yesterday. Um, so we're really happy uh, to be able to uh, be here today to talk with you all. Just to kind of very briefly give you an overview of what to expect, we're going to uh, start with an overview of some of our data and our research around the gender pay gap and pay equity. Um, we are then going to talk about public policy um, and pay equity, um, and then also share best practices uh, for colleges and employers and kind of ideas on narrowing the pay gap. So I, this is probably not going to be a shock to most folks here, but um, just to ground us a little bit, the pay gap is a pretty simple statistic to calculate. It's the pay uh, gap is the difference between women and men's typical earnings. And when you see it presented either in our own research or research uh, from a variety of different sources, it can be compared by looking at yearly earnings or uh, weekly earnings. One of the other things I, we also want to just sort of um, frame the discussion with um, is the importance of when we talk about uh, equal pay and we talk about pay equity. Um, and that is really equal pay for work of equal value. One thing we all know um, is that um, despite progress, our labor market is still pretty segregated. Um, men and women are disproportionately located in different occupations uh, throughout the labor market, right? And occupational uh, gender segregation also coupled with, uh, with racial segregation is a really a systemic factor of our labor market. So what that requires us to do is really, when we talk about pay, the pay gap and pay equity, we really look um, and try to understand equity means that uh, jobs that are female dominated and male jobs dominated that are of similar value, skill level, working condi conditions are paid the same. And it's really important for us to, um, to kind of keep this kind of framework. Um, we, I should have mentioned at the beginning, this is an interactive webinar, so we will have a series of polls, and this is our first uh, poll question. Um, so if folks can just vote in, what is the overall pay gap for women in, in general in our labor market? 53%, 73%, 83%, or the gap is not real, only perceived. If you can take a second to vote or answer. And then we should see our results very soon. So 
Um, 49% uh, said the gap is at 73%. Uh, 38% said it's at 83, 13% said it's at 53, and then no one said the gap is not real, only perceived. Um, so the correct answer is 83% uh, right now. Um, and that's the overall pay gap. That does not take into account the pay gap across race, for example, where we see differences, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but this is currently based on the latest data coming out of the uh, current population survey, um, the pay gap when we look across men and women's median earnings. So what does the data tell us? This is actually data from the American Association of University Women. And I like this chart for a variety of reasons to share. First of all, the different um, lines, uh, the different colors represent different groups of women, Asian women, white women, Black women, and Hispanic women. And you can see, and this is pretty consistent, that um, while that 83% number that I just mentioned overall, uh, when we look across categories of race and ethnicity, we begin to see some real differences. Um, so, um, and so you see that white and Asian women are earning more relative to Hispanic and black women. So the gap is smaller for those groups. And the other thing that I think the AAUW does a good job on this uh, uh, table with a uh, chart with is this part here, equity. Uh, when will we reach pay equity? And you can see for um, Asian women, we'll reach it in the year 2041. For white women, 2069. Uh, for Black women, 2369. So that's, th you know, more than 300 years from now. Um, and for Hispanic women, 2450. So it, it shows, I think, the importance of, you know, that overall pay gap number, but also how important it is to look with an intersectional lens. Um, and just another piece of data, um, and then I'll get into our data on college grads in a second, um, this is, again, within the labor market, looking across race and also educational level. Um, and you can see, um, and this is um, for 2020, uh, but the um, data is has been pretty steady throughout. Um, we see that the gap, again, we have the importance of race, and then we add in education, and we see the gap tends to get larger at higher levels of education. So what about college grads? Well, before I go to the actual um, pay gap uh, uh, in first destinations, this data comes from our student survey, our four-year student survey. Um, and this is uh, last year's student survey of graduating seniors. And we asked them, what do you expect to earn? These are not actual salaries, but expectations. And what you see here is that overall, when we look at graduating seniors, the women and uh, students who identify as non-binary expect to earn less than men. So, and what's interesting, and one can argue, right, this is beginning to see kind of the pay gap in expectations, and that's pretty powerful. And we could say, well, well men and women are just in different majors, different and going for different occupations. However, when we look within majors, we begin, we see the same gap. So this is expected salaries for male and female graduating seniors in STEM majors. And you can see here that uh, men expect to earn $10,000 more than women in STEM. The same relationship holds true in liberal arts. The gap is a little bit smaller in public service majors. Um, and that might be to the to that men are expecting to earn less in this field overall. Um, but the expectation that the graduating students have when we ask about expected salary um, is different dependent on gender. That's pretty important. Uh, we also looked at this across categories of race and gender, looking intersectionally. Um, and again, we see similar patterns, right? Asian men expected to earn the highest. Um, salaries uh, followed by white men. Um, and then when we look across uh, Hispanic women, Black women, and also Black and Hispanic men, we see lower salaries. Um, we did not have large enough cells to look at, 
at the intersections between race and gender within majors. Um, but I think this gives you really an important factor, a important insight in how graduating stu students are kind of experiencing systemic forms of bias um, and then thinking about that in terms of their own or expect expectations on salary. So what is our, our first destination data tell us? Um, what it's been consistent. Um, we show a pay gap at first destination. So um, at the first destination, college students have six months out. And that gap actually mirrors the overall gap at about 83%. Um, so students' expectations, sadly, are in line with what our data is showing in terms of um, gender pay at first. This also, at first job, this also shows the importance of um, thinking about the pay gap as something that is not something that it just emerges in a woman's life, um, but it's something that they are experiencing from that first job. And then I just wanted to include, as you know, we do a lot of um, research on internships, and I wanted to include here just um, some of our data looking across race and gender on where students are located in paid internships. We know paid internships are really critical to student success. Um, they convert more to full-time jobs than uh, job offers than unpaid internships. And also paid internships uh, pay for internship is critical to help having a student be able to complete their internship. Um, most people cannot take time out of um, work in order to complete an unpaid internship. What we see, though, is that men are overrepresented in paid internships relative to their pop their representation in the student population. So men account for about 57% of paid interns, women about 43%. When we look at that relative to um, the gender composition of student population, men are overrepresented. Um, they're about 41% of the student population, but 57% of paid interns and women are underrepresented in paid intern internships. While, while as they represent almost 59% of the student population, they only represent about 43% of paid interns. Um, when we look at categories of race, we see a similar levels of disproportionality. Hispanic students, for example, represent about 20% of the, the student population, but only about 9% of, of, of students get paid internships. Um, the same holds true for um, uh, Black students, um, about 13% of the student population and about 12% of the paid interns. So what, there are many reasons why the pay gap exists. Um, one that I talked about is uh, gender and racial segregation in the labor market. Men and women are located in different jobs, and often the value of that job is, is determined less by the, the skills and of the work, but instead by bias around gender and race. Um, we also do know that while that the pay gap does expand and get larger uh, as women and men go through their careers, and that is in part because caregiving responsibilities in families and in the home uh, typically uh, 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 fall on women. So women may take time out of the labor market, reduce hours to go part time. Um, and then just general discrimination in the labor market. Um, we do know the pay gap is something that has existed for decades and beyond and um, is a systemic form of bias and discrimination in the labor market. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Mary Jane, who's gonna talk about public policy. Thank you, Mary. Um, and thanks again to everybody else. So what, I think we have a, a clear indication um, that aside from people's expectations, there's a systemic dimension uh, to this problem. So what has been done um, in the area of public policy? Slide. Um, we're going to start with one of these poll questions. So when did the gender pay gap first emerge as a political issue? Time of the Civil War, World War I. World War II, or at the time of the Vietnam War? What do you think?
Okay, so 46% think uh, 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 that it uh, emerged at the time of the World War II, which would have been 19, around 19, early 40s. Uh, World War I, early 20th century at 22%. Vietnam War at 21% and Civil War 1860s at 11%. Well, I'm sorry to say that it was the Civil War. And while uh, the gender wage gap probably goes back a lot further, um, uh, it emerged as a political issue in the United States uh, in the 1860s under the rallying cry of equal pay for equal work. Um, and uh, there has been his demand historically uh, since then for equal pay for equal work in the United States and beyond. Um, in the 1940s, there was a failed attempt to bridge the gap. Um, the National War Labor Board first advocated uh, equal pay for equal work in 1942, and an Equal Pay Act was actually proposed in 1945 when Congress introduced the Women's Equal Pay Act, which would have made it illegal for uh, women to be paid less than men for work of comparable quality and quantity. The measure failed to pass and nothing really happened uh, in this area. Um, no progress on pay equity during the 1950s. Next question. On next slide, another poll question. So who was the first president to sign in an equal pay law in the United States? Biden, Carter, Clinton, Kennedy, Obama. Okay, so we have 30% Carter, 25 Kennedy, 24 Clinton, 19 Obama, and two Biden. And the Kennedys have it at 25%. The next major attempt to address the inequity on a national level came two decades after the war, after 1945, with the passage of the Equal Pay Act of 1963, which prohibited employers from paying male and female workers different wages for job performance of which requires, quote, equal skill, effort, and responsibility, and which are performed under similar working conditions, end quote. However, it did allow for several exceptions, including pay structures based on seniority or merit. A year later, um, the uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was signed into law, which expanded the protections um, uh, uh, laid out in the Equal Pay Act and prohibited pay discrimination based not just on gender, but also race, color, religion, and nation of origin. Uh, the 1970s and 80s um, uh, saw uh, a call for comparable worth or pay equity. Um, and in fact, the chair of Carter's Equal Employment Opportunity Commission during, singled out comparable worth as it was referred to then, as the issue of the 1980s. However, the Reagan administration, which came next, firmly supports that. Um, and pay equity as a controversy made little progress at the federal level uh, during the 70s and 80s. Um, but there was a fair amount of action at the state level. Next slide, please. In January 2009, uh, President Barack Obama signed into law the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. And Lilly Ledbetter is the blonde lady standing right behind President Obama. Um, Ms. Ledbetter had sued her employer under the Civil Rights Act. Um, her employer was uh, Goodyear, alleging that it had underpaid her for 19 years. A jury awarded her $3.5 million, but Goodyear appealed, arguing that she had failed to file her suit within the limit of 180 days specified by the law. Um, and an appeals court reversed the original decision. It went all the way to the Supreme Court 
which also ruled against the Ledbetter uh, uh, Act in a five to four vote. Um, I had the honor of being in a Zoom meeting with Ms. Ledbetter, and she shared how crushing um, that decision was, but that Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg told her that if this is how the law is written, then the law needs to be changed. Um, and in her dissenting report, uh, Justice um, Bader Ginsburg suggested that it was now a matter for Congress to take up. And while this would not change her personal situation, Ms. Ledbetter took on this fight for the benefit of others uh, similarly discriminated against. And in 2009, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act was signed into law, expanding the period for filing a discrimination uh, claim. Next slide, please. I should say there's also a Hollywood movie coming out about Lilly Ledbetter within the next couple of years. The most recent major legislative proposal to address the wage gap is the Paycheck Fairness Act of 2009, which calls for greater enforcement of anti-discrimination laws and increased penalties for violators. It initially passed the U.S. House, but failed in the Senate. And in the years since then, it has been reintroduced several times, most recently in 2021, when it again passed the House, and just fairly recently, it did not pass a vote in Congress. Next slide, please. Um, other federal commitments to advance pay equity. Um, a year ago today, which was Equal Pay Day for 2022, President Biden issued an executive order promoting pay equity and transparency within the federal um, workforce and among federal contractors. Um, the order, uh, the executive order announced that uh, Office of Personnel Management would be a, anticipating issuing a rule that would address uh, the use of salary history in hiring and pay setting for federal employees and proposed extending that consideration to federal contractors and subcontractors as well. Um, this rule would cause federal uh, contractors nationwide to essentially uh, join employers in nearly half the states across the country being limited in requesting salary history information. On this same day, the Department of Labor issued a new directive clarifying federal contractors' uh, obligation annually to analyze their compensation practices. And conducting pay audit, excuse me, pay, pay equity audits such as this really does help address and prevent disparities along gender, race, or ethnicity. Uh, next slide. So in 2022, what was the lost state in the union to finally pass a law requiring equal pay for equal work? Alabama, Mississippi, New Jersey, Vermont, or North Dakota. Okay, the Mississippi folks have it, 51%, Alabama 30, North Dakota, Vermont, and New Jersey in descending order. Um, so as of 2022, all states have enacted some kind of equal pay laws, acts, or statutes. And while, while they all have equal pay laws, some are more elaborate than, the, than others. Some regions of the country uh, believe that transparency is an important part of improving uh, pay equity. Um, and New York City actually and Colorado have very stringent rules in this regard. Um, uh, the states that have uh, transparency laws um, are, while it varies, uh, depending upon the jurisdiction, uh, these laws require employers to provide applicants with salary range for posted positions. They imply to uh, provide employees with salary ranges upon request when changing jobs or upon hire, and they include uh, salary ranges and job postings. Another tool that states use are, are salary history bans. Um, about 20 states have salary history bans. The intention is to prevent employers from using from basing salary offers on past salary histories. 
Um, in recent years, many state legislators have pushed stronger laws into action, some of the more sophisticated in addition to those salaries to ban transparency are reporting. And in 2020, California became the first state to require reporting. Um, globally, countries, uh, whoops, well, let's see. I think we're, uh, we'll just stay here for a sec. Um, reporting is a tool that's used very um, successfully internationally. Um, in addition to laws, a number of other practices have been put in place to support pay equity. Uh, building on the Obama administration's numerous actions in this area, the White House challenged businesses to take the Equal Pay Pledge. Numerous, uh, um, in fact, uh, more than 100 companies have signed the Equal Pay Pledge. Slide, please. Um, and by signing this pledge, employers acknowledge their role in, um, in treating this systemic problem and make a commitment to various uh, practices in support of that goal. Slide, please. Um, also at a national scale, but privately organized is the Employers um, for Pay Equity Consortium. It's hosted by Simmons University Institute for Inclusive Leadership and supported by a number of pro nonprofit organizations, including the National Women's Law Center. Nearly 50 companies have signed this um, agreement to support each other and employers beyond in sharing uh, best practices in this area. Number of international efforts also exist, some uh, symbolic in nature. The Equal Pay International Coalition was launched according to the UN General Assembly framework in 2017, and um, it builds partnerships slide, slide, uh, with governments, employers, uh, employees, civil society and academia um, to increase awareness um, and tried to meet a number of uh, objectives and actions based on advancement of fulfilling various international commitments. Um, some have been in place since the 1950s, like the Discrimination Convention of the UN in 1958 and the Equal Remuneration Convention of 1951. But on a more specific level, some international uh, efforts have been uh, um, legal, and a few of those uh, at the country level are Canada, in addition to its national law, has uh, six provinces have pay equity laws. Um, the UK has reporting requirements for any country, uh, excuse me, company over 250. And Australia has several um, uh, acts in place, one of which the Workplace Gender Equality Act has actually um, uh, uh, required reporting. And they have seen excuse me, um, the gap closed by about four points since then, down to 13.9%. Slide, please. Across America, a number of uh, cities have become engaged in the issue in a variety of ways, either with regulations, pledges, or campaigns in support of statewide pledges. Thank you. I'll hand the mic to Deborah. Um, thank you, uh, Mary and Mary, for sharing uh, both the data and the policies that's out there. Um, I get to now talk about some of the ways that we can, can make a difference, both as employers and as um, college universities, career centers. Uh, so I want to start by just going into more detail about our pay equity initiatives at MIT. Um, as Mary Jane and I had talked about before, uh, we both lead a pay equity working group and have for the past four years um, been trying to better understand not only um, our situation at MIT, the data, what our students and, and graduates know, uh, but also find a way to um, share information with, with others that are out there. Um, and so we are joined by, by other offices um, that are engaged with, with our, our female students um, in terms of heightening awareness, but also doing the research and the programmatic aspect of it. Um, and so you'll notice that we have a, a lovely, I would say logo, which is very MIT-ish and is an equation with um, an absolute value around X at MIT um, and that leading to pay. And we, we have it for, uh, for, for pay, but also for opportunity and advancement because we recognize that pay is kind of just the beginning, but, the, but having opportunity later on in your career will also lead to advancement. So our programming is based on that. So as I, I give you kind of 
before I go into detail, I want to give you kind of a some high level thoughts. So one of the, the books that, that we are currently reading in our working group is called uh, Good Guys, How Men Can Be Better Allies for Women in the Workplace. And they ask three questions that you can think about either for yourself or for your company or for your career center um, in terms of how to think about kind of your efforts. One, uh, can you articulate the day-to-day -day actions you are taking to improve the retention and advancement of women? Number two, what metrics do you have in place to track progress? And three, how are you holding your direct reports accountable, uh, specifically men and middle management? And so um, I think these are, are great in terms to think very broadly. And I know that the details will, will change based on, on, on what you do and how you do it. Um, but if you ask yourself these questions, it will give you a, a place to start. So I'm gonna start now with my um, poll question. I hope I have some employers out there. Um, I would love to hear from our employers. Um, does your company perform a pay equity analysis? Yes, no, or I don't know. Okay, I, I'm hoping that we've got some, some answers to that. Um, let's see what it says. We have 26% yes, um, no is 19%, and I don't know is 55%. So thank you, thank you for answering the poll, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on. But I, I, I want to talk about our efforts with employers. Um, when our working group first started out, we were focused on our students and our candidates and really equipping them with, with information. Uh, but then we realized quickly that we had to help our employers um, understand what our, our students and, and graduates are, are, are wanting and asking for. So this past fall for our career fair, um, we did um, something a, a little different than we had done in, in previous years, which is we asked our employers who were attending the career fair four questions, really five questions around pay equity. We asked them, um, have the company adopted any policies regarding transparency in pay? Did they do anything such as taking negotiation out of the interview process? And that can include having candidates not list their salaries, but also not requiring candidates to negotiate. Do they run pay equity analysis on salaries, bonuses, and equity across all their occupations? Do they train their managers on how to create a culture of pay equity? And are their pay equity efforts embedded into their broader equity initiatives? Um, and so the results of that, that was, was interesting. We, we use this as a filter for our students so that they could learn more about who they may choose to talk to at a career fair. But we also use it as a pulse to see what employers are doing. So out of the 155 that responded, um, you can see some representative results. Um, what a lot of companies do, which is we're very happy about, is 76.1% um, uh, run pay equity analysis. Um, and though that majority lines up with, with what we heard from those in attendance. Uh, we had another 54.2% take negotiation out of the interview process. Um, and then for in terms of transparency, listing the pay and the salary range, we had 24.5%. And embedding equal pay efforts into broader initiatives was 37.4%, along with training managers were 46.5%. Now, out of all of the 155, I would say we only had 10 or 6.5% who did all of these things. Um, and you know, that, that just shows kind of they have thought about the process in general. The, the one note that I would say, and I think we, we saw that with, um, with some people not knowing, is that um, some of my, my companies could not answer the question and they, they provided that information. Um, it said, you know, I'm guessing, I think this is what we do. Um, and so actually knowing some, some things that, that your company does is going to be helpful. So to follow up with this, one of the, the 
things that we did was actually did focus groups with select companies, um, both in the fall and a little bit in the spring. And we wanted to kind of match up what we're hearing from the number side with um, an explanation of, of how do you think about pay equity? How do you carry out some of these, these new uh, legislation that's been passed out to you? Um, and what we heard from you know, a select few companies was just about um, the opportunities that are there. Uh, Mary Jane talked about the White House Equal Pay Pledge previously. And so some companies participated in that along with other pledges, perhaps by the state or by the UN. Um, they appreciate the opportunity to be proactive in their market analysis and that um, if they had a set rate, particularly for, for new jobs or internships, it made things a lot easier for them when they went back for, to do the pay equity analysis to know that they were lining up. And then some really talked about equity being a part of their diversity efforts and publicizing that so that it's not something that is kind of done, I, I would say, behind the scenes or done when only people uh, asked about it, but, but something that candidates can see that companies do. They, they also talked about the challenges that come with this, um, change management and really working with supervisors. Um, as many of us know, like, you know, salary, benefits, you know, if a, if a supervisor really wants someone, that is when uh, they start to, I would say, negotiate um, on certain things, and equity can be one of those things. Uh, but also keeping up with different state regulations. Um, we know that New York recently passed their, their there's transparency laws, but keeping up with that and making sure that they were, um, you know, following everything that's going on um, was, was a challenge. And then um, just Again, uh, an awareness of what the company does. We were fortunate to talk to a compensation um, person and they said, you know, we do all these things, um, but my, my team that goes out for recruiting, they may not be aware of all that we do um, and how often we do. So that was one of the lessons learned um, is, is really knowing what, what goes on um, in, your, in your company. Um, as we think about resources for employers, um, we we know that supporting you is, is the way that all of us can can get to uh, pay equity. And so the the next page actually lists some resources that we've pulled together in case you're interested in this topic. Um, these range from articles um, to quick webinars. I recently listened to the PaySquell U.S. Pay Transparency Pay Equity and Fair Pay Practices uh, webinar. And um, it was helpful in really thinking about um, what is going on now and what we can think about. So now I'm gonna move on to resources for career centers. And I think I'm gonna wait till the PowerPoint matches up a little bit. Okay, for some reason, um, here we go, we resume slideshow. We're, we're back on, um, but we, we have a question, a poll question for career centers. So let's go ahead and put that up. For career centers, do you advise or counsel your graduates on pay equity? So if you could take a, a few seconds to answer that question. And if you're curious about what pay equity is, I'm going to send you back to uh, Mary's definition, which is equal pay for work or equal value, but really looking at addressing gender segregated labor market, looking at skills, values, working conditions, things like that. Okay, let's see what our results might look like. Okay, so we have yes for 54%. Yes, we like to hear that. 20% no, but 26% 
we're in the works, we're thinking about it. Great. I, I'm glad that one, you're you're here to, to hear the importance of it. Um, but my plan is to kind of give you some, some ideas of some things that you can do next. So let's talk about best practices for career centers. Um, and so I, I always like to start, especially with career centers, that sometimes, you know, we're in positions where our students will have um, maybe one offer. And so they feel like they don't have power or agency to either negotiate or know what they're, they're doing. And I would say, um, yes, and. Um, even if they only have one offer, uh, we can empower them and give them knowledge so that they can do whatever they wish to with the information. And that's really um, what the goal here. So just in terms of, of best practices, um, some things that I think advisors and particularly employer relations staff should know, um, you should know about the pay equity laws and policies in the states that your graduates work in. Um, and so for us, our graduates tend to go to maybe 10, 15 primary states. Just knowing that um, is going to put you at a place of, of information. Um, and when you're working with um, whether it's employers or students, um, knowing you know what, what is expected of them, whether it's salary transparency or, or, or more is, is going to be helpful. Uh, the other thing that I think is important for advisors and employer relations staff to know is the repercussions of women asking about salary. So there was a question that I saw for someone that said, you know, do we think that there's a difference between how men and women negotiate when given an offer? Um, I don't know if there's been a study about that. Maybe Mary will answer that question, uh, but I know that the outcome is different. Right. And so that's what as a, a career center uh, staff member, that's what you have to know, that the outcome is different. So even as you're working with with students and they said, well, you know what, I did what you, you suggested and it, it didn't turn out well for me, um, helping them kind of think about that and think about next steps um, and not let one experience um, stop them from from moving on. Um, the other things that I think career centers should know is how to educate students about occupational choice. We talked about occupational segregation earlier, um, and particularly for some fields, what you choose to go into will make a big difference in the pay that you receive. Um, and so additionally, we, our, our students, our candidates, they should know about their rights and what questions they can ask employers even before engaging. Um, Things are very fast when it's, it's job offer time um, and things move very quickly. Um, and I'm gonna tell you about some, some resources um, that can help your, your, your students. Um, teaching negotiation skills, both for their now career and their later career. Um, the, the gap gets even more significant the more you progress in your career. So what starts off um, as, as a smaller gap widens. And so giving uh, students kind of that information just so that they are aware of that and they're not just, you know, oh, I'm sure my employer is, is paying me fairly. Um, and they're, they're negotiation, negotiating at, at different points of their career. Um, reliable sources of, of salary information. I think that that, that is important. Um, data from both your university, if you have it, but also us out there um, by industry and by geographic le level. And then also just the notion that equity is more than just salary. Um, it can include things as relocation bonuses. I've heard of this where some people get to start off um, at it as easier and have an easier time because they were able to negotiate their, their relocation. So really think about, about that. As we move on and we think about um, other best practices, um, asking questions to employers about their diversity efforts um, and specifically pay equity, equity from an asset model. Um, we, we want to come from a, a place of helping and supporting each other. And so you can ask questions such as how often is pay analysis done in their company? How do you ensure all your graduates start off at, at the same level for the, for this, the same work? Um, and then what do they do along someone's career um, in terms of, of equity? Um, data analysis, um, if I have anyone uh, in the crowd who, who does the outcomes data for your school and you're asking about salary. I know this is an extra ask because you're like, you know, Deb, I can barely do what's, what's asked of me. But 
if you can do an analysis and see the differences between uh, your graduates uh, before, I would say your, your first entrance out, but also later, that is helpful in understanding the gap at your university. Um, we did it, it allowed us to focus in on certain majors and certain industries um, and do our programming for those particular groups, uh, making sure that they have the information that they need to be successful when they, they negotiate. Uh, I think a worthy collaboration is with your alumni office. Um, as we have talked about, it is a long-term pro problem. So alumni surveys, uh, but also negotiation strategies. Um, I think sometimes we focus too much on kind of the, the career and not thinking about the other parts of it. Um, and so um, a, as we help our, our, our women alum really think about empowerment programs and negotiation strategies. Um, and then last um, is intersectionality of, of pay equity. Um, this is, is quite as important. There was a question just asking about, you know, how do we define Asian and, and different things? We, we talked a little bit about intersectionality. And if we go to the, the next slide, you will see a link to um, all the resources that we have put together, including one that talks about the intersectionality of equal pay. Um, in that, we break down the, the different groups, offer some resources, uh, but one of the resources that I pay particular attention to is um, negotiating as a woman of color and the, the different dynamics that are in play. Um, and so we, we have to think about that for, for all of our students. So I'm going to stop with like kind of this last resource, which is um, one of the, the the projects that our pay equity group did was um, we we got lawyers from across the U.S. to put together um, what we called job offer templates that reviews your rights as as a um, candidate and as an employer. Um, we have 30 out of the 50 states listed. Um, and so these are available to everyone. They are one to two page, page PDF templates. If we just wanna point it to the states that your students go to the most, um, that, that might be the most helpful. But if you wanna point it to all of, the, of what we have, um, this is, I would say, uh, MIT's contribution to, to the greater uh, career centers that are out there, um, recognizing our, our privilege to, to have the resources to gather uh, this data. Uh, we wanna find a way to, to share it um, very broadly. So as we end there, we're going to uh, open up to your questions. Thank you. And, um... I want to apologize for our technical glitch when one of the when the last poll got launched somehow uh, our the computers overrode each other and uh, but Deborah didn't miss a beat <laughs> so um, I do apologize to everyone for that. Um, we do have um, some questions in the Q and A, um, so I can um, maybe share them um, with folks. Um, uh, one question is, what is the appropriate way to handle being an, being asked for salary history on an application if you're in a state that has a salary ban? So kind of how would we counsel um, students for that, I think, is, is the question. Um, I'm not sure um, if, uh, Deborah, you have come across that um, at MIT um, and want to maybe share what you would talk, tell students. So, so we usually encourage students actually not to, to fill that out, or if they have to fill it out, do like a XX or OO, figure out kind of what the, the definitions is, and then let them come back to you, right? Um, because then if they come back to you, they have to provide information about why they're asking that question. And then it allows your, 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 your student or candidate to come back and say, well, you know what, I, I, I don't feel comfortable sharing that. Um, and, you know, in, in this particular state, I thought that, that that wasn't a question that you're allowed to ask before the interview process. Um, and so we, we try to get, you know, people, if you're going to ask the question, we're going to help you educate at the same time. So hopefully you're not asking other people that question. 
That's great. And the resources um, that Deborah shared from MIT, I think are really, really critical to students because they can look, oh, they're getting an offer from New York or California or Florida, wherever it is, and they can look at what their rights are immediately. Um, and I think that is just an incredible uh, form of information that students that are critical to students. Um, uh, there's another question in the chat about, do we think part of the pay gap is due to differences in how men versus women negotiate when given an offer. Um, so there is uh, research around negotiation, certainly, um, and the Harvard Business Review article that we had that was in the slide deck um, also points to men and women tend to negotiate at the same rates, um, but women don't get the higher salary, right? Um, so there is forms of bias within the negotiation field. Um, that being said, though, it is really important to empower our, all our students, but particularly our women students, with negotiation skills, right? Um, and as Deborah talked about, negotiating not just on salary, but also on other benefits, whether it's bonuses, relocation monies, et cetera, kind of looking holistically um, at the pay. I don't know, Deborah or Mary Jane, if you want to add to that. I would just add... Um... Uh, when advising women students, um, you know, there's research on the kind of backlash to women negotiating. And so being mindful about ways that women need to negotiate as opposed to the standard negotiation advice. Um, and then I, I also think that contextualizing negotiation it, it, uh, more broadly is important because this is a systemic problem and, and truly young women graduates shouldn't feel as though they're and uh, their, for the rest of their life, um, salaries should depend upon their negotiation skills. Not everybody's a great negotiator. And as it was pointed out earlier, that with in Mary and your uh, statements about first salary, the, the inequity, the price that a woman pays is passed on if she ends up having a family and goes with her right through to her retirement in terms of any you know, 401k, pension benefit, social security. So it's a big, that's a lot to put on a 22 year old shoulder and, and uh, in terms of her negotiating skills. Yeah, and then the only thing that I would add is I, I think people think about negotiation only when it's time to do a salary or job or a promotion and negotiation happens day to day. Um, whether you are trying to select what project you're gonna work on and maybe that project is gonna get you that visibility that you need to be, uh, you know, I would say access to to other people or it might uh, make a difference in the bonus that you receive. The negotiations happens every day and I think we have to teach all of our students about that, right? It's not just during kind of a time where I'm getting a promotion or I'm gonna get a new job. Yeah, that's it, a great point. Go ahead, Deborah, in that In that context, Deborah. I think your um, comments about male allies is, is particularly important that male leaders recognize um, when there's an opportunity to give uh, a young woman an opportunity for advancement or a specific project that's going to get her visibility. I mean, it's we're not in this alone. Right. That's a great point. Um, there was also a question that actually I don't have the answer to, are the differences in salary negotiations between non-remote and remote workers? Um, and I don't know if I've ever seen data. I think it's a great question that Floor put into the chat. And I don't think I've ever actually seen data on that. Um, but it is something that, I, that we should be collecting data on um, broadly um, because you know, there are differences obviously in working conditions, et cetera. So it'd be interesting to look at that. So I think, great question. I, I don't know of any studies. I don't know if Mary Jane or Deborah know of any. No, not, not yet. I think people are just um, figuring out what that, what that means, right? Um, so not yet hopefully in the future. So uh, there, there, there is an ethical question up <laughs> here, uh, which is I work at a university where we collect salary data, job titles, company names. And recently I noticed that a female student and a male student went to work for the same company, same location, same job title, and the female was paid 5K less. We keep this information confidential. So I felt like I couldn't do anything about this, even though it was blatantly inequity. Have you seen, have you been in this situation before? Is there anything we can do as career services when we see this? So 
I'm going to talk about it kind of from the, the data point of view, right? Um, which is when you're looking at data, it's hard to just look at two two pieces of data and say one is not fair versus another. When we did our, our data analysis at MIT, um, we involved our institutional research in it, um, and we looked at it for significance. So we were running models on the data um, and not just looking at apple for apple and say this is not the same. Um, we, we don't know why the, the, the students were, were being paid less, right? Um, and so, you know, I would say that you can't go to the company and say you paid a, a female student this much less or whatever. I think you can ask them about how do they ensure that all students are paid fairly, right? And the same. So I think you, you have to approach it from an asset model um, and understand, hopefully understand better how they, how they make offers. But there could be many different factors that went into to this, um, including previous experience. And so unless we're collecting kind of all that, that data, we don't know. But I, I also let companies do their own pay equity analysis. Um, when I'm looking at it from the Career Center point of view, I'm looking for not individual cases, but majors and industries where there's a difference. Um, and that means that if I can kind of recognize those areas, then that means that I can do something on a greater scale. Great, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, I think that's, that's an important question. Um, um, another question um, in, uh, and I think this might be one of our last questions, we only have about three minutes left, but how about data on negotiating for remote work options in general? Um, so, um, you know, we can look, Flora, and see, again, I haven't seen anything kind of cross my, my radar around that. Um, but um, I don't know, Deborah, if you have advice that you provide to students when they're negotiating for remote jobs at all, or? Um, you know, so for, for us, our students have had, I would say, hybrid jobs for, for so many years. Um, and so our negotiation has, has always been the same, like there's, there's not a, a difference. Um, and so I, I will say that I, I, I can't answer this question, but I, I don't know if there's anyone in the audience who feels like they can answer this question. Um, I think it's a, a really good question. Um, I mean, I think that employers kind of know what they have to provide to, to candidates in order for them to be successful. Um, and what the person might be alluding to is like, is there a pay differential? I think that's something that, that companies are, are trying to figure out. I think it's a great question also um, and a great area for us to be thinking about in terms of research. Um, in the, uh, there's one last question before we wrap up in two minutes is how can we educate our students on gender gap, gender gap issues without feel, them feeling discouraged or overwhelmed? I think that is a great question also. Um, and one of the things I would, I would recommend and I'd love to hear from my panelists is first just turning to MIT's resources, right? So that students are aware of their rights, right? So then they're empowered in, in the negotiations in the workplace and society. Um, but also the data, the research that comes out of that. So we know that companies that, that are transparent about their salaries have much smaller pay gaps, right? So that's a way to close the gap. So um, I think critical is really being sure our students are, are very aware of what their rights are um, when they're going into those situations. Um, and also the successful research on how we cl can close the gap, because we, we do know some of that. I don't know, Deborah or Mary Jane, if you want to add to that. Well, Mayor, I think you hit right on it with knowledge being power, um, especially starting out. And I, I see someone just put notes about mentoring. Mentoring is so important um, for, for all candidates, but particularly for women and women of color. Um, one of my colleagues, Tabby, who is, is also in the chat, um, she does a lot of our programming where we, we do programming specifically for our, our, our students of color. Um, and one of the things that we talk about is the importance of a mentor, because a mentor can help you um, throughout your career, making sure that you're getting the right opportunities and so that you're in place for advancement, but also have open discussions about salary with you. If you find someone that you trust, then you can be like, oh, Deb, I just don't feel like I'm, I'm being paid fairly. How might I think about approaching my boss with that? Um, and typically, um, if those people are in the, the right positions, meaning that they are hiring managers or they know a lot, 
or they have access to hiring managers, they're going to they're going to help someone who is their mentee. Um, so I think mentorship is is very key. I, I would just add quickly to that, uh, your network broadly and engaging your alum organization. Until recently, I was president of AMADA, the Women's Alum Association, which is how Deb and I connected initially. And um, I'm sure that the alum at your schools are as generous as ours and, and having uh, that as a, a resourceful network for students, I think is really meaningful as well. I agree. Well, uh, we're at the top of the hour. So first, I want to thank uh, our two pa our panelists, Mary Jane Daly and Deb Liverman, for just the incredible amount of uh, information and the resources that they're sharing beyond MIT um, for students, which is wonderful. And I want to thank everybody for the chat and the discussion and spending your an hour with us. Um, it was uh, wonderful to be here. And thank you so much for all you are doing uh, to help close the pay gap. <laughs>